He is wiped out by his grace through faith in Christ. Your every sin, every sin, past, present, future. Christian hedonist is somebody who says that my greatest joy, my greatest good is God. And therefore, I will pursue that joy and I will pursue that God above all else. So God's glorified and I'm satisfied. You are now listening to the Pastor Discussions Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 87 of the Pastor Discussions Podcast. I'm John. And I'm John. This is your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life. We are back and I am currently in Missouri. Well, not currently, but as you listen to this. Yeah. I'm in Missouri. So, yeah. So, uh, vacation. <laughs> vacation with three kids. This is going to be interesting. Because I don't know. We've, we've done. It all depends on the baby. Yeah, I know, right? Like, Everything yeah. depends on the baby. Yeah. There's little bundles of sin. This last one, um, Ian, mm-hmm. he was a, he's been really good. So even as a little baby, we could just drag him around basically anywhere. And he, he's, if he's tired, he just goes to sleep. That's nice. So. Ollie's been fighting sleep. She just Mm. refuses to sleep. So Carly was telling me this morning that there's this like four month sleep regression thing. And she's like, I didn't realize how lucky we had it with the other two because we never experienced it with them. Like she was up between one and 4 a.m. this morning. Yeah. Um, So ah, someday we'll get sleep, I guess. I can't remember if we had that with our girls, but Ian was like almost from the very beginning. Just sleep. Good sleeper. Yeah. We Still had, is to this day. <laughs> you lay him down and he just goes to sleep. That's awesome. So. Uh, I guess you, you don't get sleep because they're up when they're young and then you don't get sleep because they're out when they're older. <laughs> so I don't know if we'll ever get sleep. So <laughs> I guess you kind of, that's one of the things you kiss goodbye when you become a parent. So anyway, well, we're part of the Bar Podcast Network. Check out the Bar Podcast podcasts on the com. That's a lot of Bar Podcasts in one sentence. And uh, get some Resurrection Coffee Co. Coffee. ResurrectionCoffeeCo.com. Go check them out and help church planting in Chicago. Should, um, should we, we should plug Joel's podcast too. Yeah, man. Think Podcast. Yeah. The Think Podcast. You ought to check that out. Joel set a case um, on apologetics. He's been having some really good content lately. Like I've been watching his live shows on Facebook and it's been really, really good. Yeah, they had one on... I think we're behind the times, man, because we just do audio podcasts and all these other people are doing like these oh. Facebook Live things like Theology yeah. Nights and... Everyone else must not be very busy, so... <laughs> <laughs> or they're much more technically savvy than we are. <laughs> we figured out how to record. That's all you get. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm plenty good with that. I don't want my mug on camera. Nobody wants our mugs on camera. Yeah. That's just... This is This is... God's grace to you that you just get to <laughs> listen to us and don't have to see us. Oh man. Well, anyway, he does a good job. They had yeah. one. Uh, I really enjoyed, they did one on the law, the purpose of the law. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really helpful and really good. So yeah, he's got a, uh, he's got um, Joe Thorne coming up on. An yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Those are two that don't look anything alike. <laughs> Very, yeah. <laughs> Joe's all grungy and Joel's put just, together. Yeah. He's kind of hip put together. Yeah. So, put together is a good way to put yeah. it. I was talking to, um, to, uh, Adam Stair from two pillars, like uh, one time after he preached and I was like, where do you shop for your clothes? You're just like really put together. Is he like <laughs> stitch fix or something like that? Nah, I think it was a, uh, oh, where was it? I can't remember now, but so I went there and I, I tried to, uh, it was, it's, it's, uh, that, that, um, outlets under near Omaha. There's a store there for whatever this is. I can't remember what the name of the store was, but anyway, I got some button up shirts and everything and it's, I can't pull it off. <laughs> it's not, it's just not me. I can't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you could, but you'd have to like start all over. Oh my gosh. Like it's I just can't so do much it. work. Like I, I just like wearing t-shirts. Well, and the problem shorts, is I so. use my arms so stinking much in the stupid sermons. Like if I don't have some flexibility in the shoulders and the back, well, you just got to buy the right shirt. Oh, yeah, I guess. Then that's really expensive. Yeah. That's the that, problem. Right. <laughs> that's why I don't wear suit coats when I preach. So I feel like I'm going to rip the back out of it. <laughs> Make some arm gesture. <laughs> I, I I like suit coats, but it's like so against um, everything that I, I am. <laughs> um, I've, I have one. 
So and and it's kind of tight. I have that same issue because yeah. I I use my hands a lot. It's, I'd like to say it's my broad, massive, strong shoulders, but that would be a massive lie. It's not that. I think it's my abnormally large I also waistline. Get extremely hot wearing a yeah, I know, a right? Coat. Oh my goodness! Especially when you're up and preaching, those lights uh, are shining on you. Well, you can't. You can't pity we, me. Pity me. We this have is, LED lights. There's no heat on the stage. Any okay. Well, maybe it's. I don't know what it is. It's 10 degrees hotter on the stage than it, it is. I know. The, like you. I think it's just part of speaking. You just get. Uh, uh, like <laughs> douse myself in first, water or the something. First, uh, the first week that you were sick, uh -huh. and I had to preach. So I did uh, music and song. Um, music and song. Uh, I did song. I don't know why I'm saying music and song. It's the same thing. <laughs> music and preaching. <laughs> so I did song and preaching. I led both. And I was so sweaty <laughs> by the time I got to, um, I think it was just because of the, the, the stress of having the, not have any time to prepare. Yeah. By the time I, uh, started my sermon, I was like, my, I had beads of sweat all over the place. You were like a one man show, dude. It was like, uh, I had this picture in my head of, if you've ever seen the original Mary Poppins, yeah. uh, Dick Van Dyke it with his little the... drum set thing and <laughs> <laughs> just put a microphone up there and you're good to go. But yeah, man, it's a, uh, I don't know. I can't do preaching in a suit coat. It just, I've tried. It's just way too restrictive. I, I did it when I first got here because I think that was part of the expectation uh, and uh, sort of eased my way out of that one. Uh, so that brings us to the topic for today. <laughs> <laughs> Good transition. Yeah, this is like, we're two for two now. <laughs> um, so uh, there are, this is this is not really a super challenge of multi-generational church wearing a suit coat, but uh, it, could, it, can, it be. can be. I guess it brings up, uh, it brings up the topic of uh, challenges that churches face um, in having a multi-generational congregation mm. and overcoming those challenges. So I think uh, like the first starting out, I think a healthy church should have a multi-generational, multi multi-generational, multi-ethnic. Uh, I think it should reflect the community. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think, the, I think a healthy whatever church should reflect yeah. the community. So if your community is multi-ethnic, then your church should look like that. If your yeah. community is multi-generational, your church should look like that. So the like the perfect example of that is like, like down, urban places aren't necessarily exactly. That's that what way. I was going to say. Like down in Kansas City, um, uh, River Market Community yeah. Church, they're in a very hip, young yeah. neighborhood. Yep. So their church isn't necessarily going to look like that. That doesn't mean they're not healthy. Yeah. But having a healthy church means that it should like for us, it's a rural community of nine thousand. There's all ages. There's different ethnicities. So we want our church to look like the community yeah. as far as uh, the diversity that we have within our, our church. We've got college students, we've got elderly, we've got middle-aged, we've got young families, we've got little kids. Uh, and I'm really thankful for that. Like, I think that that's, that's a huge blessing that God has given us as a church. Yet at the same time, whenever you put, put people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different ages, different generations in a confined space together, uh, there can be challenges to that. Right. So let's talk about maybe some of those challenges. So I think the biggest underlining thing is just um, unity. And I don't mean, I've learned a lesson in, uh, I recently preached on Colossians 3, 12 through 17 on the unity of the church. And um, just one of the comments uh, or some feedback that I had heard and, and there's no angst or anything, right? Mm -hmm. it's just, it was just a, a conversation is sometimes it comes across as, as, well, you just think we all hate each other. And I don't think that that's, no. that's what it is. I don't, disunity is not dislike. It's yeah. not um, like angst against one another. Right. Like their disunity is just, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. We won't have any conflict or anything, but I like to be in my bubble. You like to be in your bubble. And or you should do your thing the way I do my thing. Yeah, it can, can be, come, it can be that, that can too. But I think too. sometimes that can be, fall into that angst category of, yeah. of having, holding something against somebody. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges for multi-generational churches or multi-ethnic churches is having unity that is one that we're unified around a mission Right. We're unified around what God has us to do. And we will not fall in 
to the things that we're used to falling into that hurt that mission, yeah. that work against that mission. And I think that's where we see the biggest problem with unity in multi-generational and ethnic churches is, well, we're all generally together. Mm-hmm. We like coming together to worship. But outside of that, I'm, I don't really have people that I'm in relationship with and I'm working towards the same mission mm-hmm. that are outside of my sphere of age group or ethnicity or whatever it is. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest challenge that I've seen in multi, specifically multi-generational is just helping people to see that you need to have relationships with people from different generations yeah. um, and help us all see that we're all on the same page and we're all moving in the same direction. Yeah. There, there are two things that come to mind for me. Um, I was having an interesting conversation with somebody the other day and uh, multi-generational churches and multi-ethnic churches uh, are basically multicultural churches. Yeah. So you have different cultures, different values, different ways of doing things between um, the older generation and my kids' generation and yeah. the middle age generation and my generation. And uh, especially if you add ethnicity into that, you've got cultural, um, I, don't, I don't use baggage in a negative sense, right. but we all have these cultural things that we bring with us, whether it's a like an Anglo culture, or African American culture, or a Latino culture, whatever it is, um, we all have these things that we bring with us. Whether it's in musical style or expectation of preaching, or what it looks like to do evangelism, or what fellowship looks like, even uh, there's different ideas that everybody has. And so, I think one of the big challenges in having a diverse church like that is navigating all of those different cultural barriers that come up. So this interesting conversation was uh, like, so just take technology, for example. Mm. Um, My mom and dad remember putting a man on the moon and they never had cell phones. They had the, they had the rotary phones. Yeah. Uh, They didn't even have the punch phones. They had the, the old school rotary phones and uh, the operator was a thing. Like you could dial zero Right. And reach an operator and get a number for somebody or something. And uh, I have in my pocket more computing power than (laughs) was used to send the man to the moon. Yeah. Uh, So we watched this movie, uh, Hidden Figures, and it was like the first computer and it had these cards and it would just it would just punch holes in these cards or put numbers on these. It was just weird. Like I was like, how do you get anything out of that? Um, And. So the rate of change that we've experienced in our culture over the last hundred years, less than that, over the last, even the last 20 years, 30 years, um, has created this sort of snowball effect yeah. where you and I think that things through differently than um, our parents' generation. And we're more comfortable with the rapid pace of exactly. things Exactly, change. Than somebody um, who's 30 years older than we are. We've gotten accustomed to communicating in different ways. Right. Um, and our kids are going to be drastically different from us. Right. Um, there's this, I was talking to a, a college student who's doing her student teaching the other day. And she was saying like, kids no longer use Facebook. Like we both felt very <laughs> old at that point, you know, because they're using some other thing. Yeah. Um, and so that, that cultural the cultural barriers that maybe come from that um i think is a is a significant thing the other thing that i just lost okay well we'll come back we'll to come that. back to that but yeah i think that 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 um that cultural barrier is oh i remember what it was uh people in different age groups in particular if we're talking about multi-generational church have very different needs at different phases in life, um, which makes it very difficult, not only from a pastoral perspective, but also from a congregational perspective. Because it's very hard for somebody that's in college to understand um, having physical ailments on a regular basis. And it's very hard for somebody that's um, in uh, sort of a later phase of life to understand what it's like to grow up and get a job in our culture and our economic climate and everything else that we have today because they're sort of established, you know? So there, there are these different um, phases in life that present different needs 
that are that can be difficult to understand because of that rapid pace of change. So I think those are two barriers that I've seen uh, that can hinder. Uh, really, what we're talking about is is fellowship and unity mm-hmm. across generations. Do you think the and this is this is not just aimed at one one group or the other, but I think there's also the barrier, and I think this is beyond this is beyond just um, multi generational and ethnic uh, church communities. This is kind of to everything. There is a an overriding feeling, and we let that feeling dominate how we act of feeling comfortable in our conversations and in mm-hmm. our relationships. And in general, the people that we feel most comfortable with are the people that are going through the same things that we're going through, Yeah, that think the same way that we do, who agree with most of what we think. Like we, yeah. there's common ground, there's common things to think about. Common experiences. Yeah, there's common things to talk about. Um, we're up on the same cultural things, right? Yeah. We speak the same language, yeah. uh, as far as lingo goes. And so we get used to that and we're comfortable in that and we like that. And what tends to ha- happen is we build our lives around those relationships. Mm-hmm. And so I, and this just, I think this is, this is relevant to this conversation. I think it's relevant um, across the board, not just in this conversation. This is this is just a unity issue in general, but Mm -hmm. we're missing out on everything that people of different, um, who are in different phases in life, um, bring to the table. So if you're older and having a relationship with a younger person, um, can reignite passion. It can energize you. It can help you see something that you didn't see. And if you're a younger person having a relationship with an older person, they can give you advice on things that they've walked through that you're walking through now and yeah. what it looks like at the end. And they can be an encouragement to There's you. Wisdom and, with age. Yeah. So when we isolate ourselves to only the group of people that um, we're walking through the same phase of life and we're actually hindering um, our ability to walk through those things we're yeah. we're in some ways rejecting the wisdom of God that comes through people who have l- looked at life differently or are living life at a different phase and can speak into our own lives. So I don't think that this is necessarily just a, <clears throat> we need to be uni- unified within the church walls, but this is something that pertains to our life as a whole. Uh, yeah. I think, and I think what we're seeing in the church is how we live outside of the church has bled into how we do relationships inside. And I think a lot of that comes down to not understanding. Like, <clears throat> I'll be honest, like I have, I struggle to understand the older generation at times um, because I'm so far removed from the way that they've grown up and the way that they did things and maybe some of the I think up, your upbringing comes into that too. I do too. Like, yeah. I was raised in the evangelical church. You weren't. Mm-hmm. So I can relate a little bit more to where they're coming from, I think, yeah. than, uh, than you can. I think so too. But I, I do think like there's, um, there can be this lack of understanding. So take, for example, like my parents, they don't understand. I mean, we grew, I grew up with them, right? right? They don't understand some of the decisions that we make and some of the the reasons that we do things the way we do. And that doesn't just have to do with uh, me being a Christian. It has to do with just our outlook on life and the views that we have on life and the way that we uh, interpret the world around us. Um, And so I think that 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 lack of understanding can play into that fear or that reluctance to build relationships with people that are in a different age group than you. I think it also can lead to judgmental Mm -hmm. attitudes. So you don't do things the way I would do them. Right. And you don't. Ergo, you're wrong. Yeah. You don't do A, B, and C the way that I would do it. And and then I get upset about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And in our culture, we've got this Midwest niceness going on. So we don't talk about those things, right? but it causes discontentment. At least with the person that we have, we have. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so I think like part of it is just an unwillingness to, to step out and say, Hey, here's what I'm seeing. And, and then uh, can you help me understand why 
you're doing things this way or why you uh, would do this. Instead of instead, what we tend to do is we judge people mm-hmm. and we, we do this thing where, well, I wouldn't have done it that way in my mind. You should probably think about doing it this way. And yeah. it comes off as this just – it comes off Arrogance, as arrogant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily meant to be that way, but there's an unwillingness to to step outside of our own shoes right. and and say, okay, what am I missing here? And, and that's, be humble about it in in doing it. And that's across the generation. Right, it goes both ways. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something you said um, a few minutes ago, uh, and I know you know this, and I've probably mentioned this before, but uh, a couple of the most influential people in my life have been old enough to be my dad and my grandfather. So, um, these, these families really, I mean, husband and wife, both have been hugely, hugely influential. I can't even talk. Um, and their influence came through relationship. Yeah. Uh, in other words, like when we were in Missouri, we were poor and couldn't make it home for Thanksgiving. They invited us over for Thanksgiving and made us a part of their family. They, they sought us out. They pursued us, not not to be a project, but to get to know us. And because they genuinely cared. Yeah, because they genuinely cared. And so over time, those um, those people, and it's more than just these two, but I just want to illustrate that it's like differing age groups, uh, have become hugely influential and a huge blessing to me. Mm. I was having a conversation with Jeff the other day, and he's like, you know, it's really interesting that when we first met and when we first started getting to know one another and and even as you were like in seminary, like I was the one pushing you, I was the one giving you advice. And now I come to you for advice too. Um, And so there's this reciprocal benefit of having relationships with people outside of our own generation that I think can be difficult to see unless you've actually experienced it on both, both sides. Uh, Because let's be honest, like if you're, if you're an older person that's um, getting to know a younger person, it's just as hard as a younger person getting to know an older person because of those barriers that we talked about. Mm. But you overcome that and you get to know one another and you get to trust one another and you see one another's heart and you, you care for one another. You help one another grow in different ways. I think it's just getting people to the point of, of breaking through that uncomfortable beginning. Yeah. Um I, and Which I've is ex- a challenge for me in every single generation. Like I am an awkward first contact person. <laughs> it's just weird. I, yeah. mean, I don't know what to talk about. I'm not good at small talk. I'm not either. Like, uh, and I think there's a lot of people that are in that same category. Um, I wonder how much of that too is just there's like cultural expectation to be able to, this is how you're supposed to have a conversation. Yeah. There should never be awkward silence. Um, <laughs> you just stare at one another for 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. I guess we're done here. Yeah. I mean, I mean, sometimes that, and, and I think there's, there's, there is a place where you can say, okay, this just isn't, we just don't jive. Yeah. Right. But if your default is, I don't jive with anybody outside of um, people in my, demographic then i think there's a there's an issue of unity you're not putting the other person before yourself you're you're not thinking of um how can i be an encouragement to this person how right. how can i how can we mutually help the words of christ to dwell within us yeah um how how can we teach and admonish one another yeah um if we don't have those relationships so and I think there's lots of different barriers to that. Um, so, okay, so we talked a little bit about um, what those barriers are, right? Right, And yeah. what they look like. So so what are some ways in which, um, maybe let's, let's do this in two ways. So if, if, you're, if you're pastoring, what are some w- ways in which you can help? Maybe it's you that needs the help, but uh, yeah. so some things that you can do, but some ways in which you can help your congregation to overcome some of those things. And then just for the individual, the normal uh, everyday church goer, the normal believer, how, what are some ways in which you can implement, um, something in which it's going to help you to, to break through that, that barrier of kind of comfort and, and kind of what we go back to the ideal setting of, I I don't want to be uncomfortable for any amount of time. Right. Uh, so the first one is pastors, um, 
I think the first the first barrier to overcome is your own self. Yeah. Um, especially for us who are younger pastors. Uh like I'll be honest, like it can be seriously intimidating to come into a church with people that have been in the church walking with the Lord for forty years and try to pastor them. Like that is just that for me, that has been the most challenging aspect of stepping into a church that had uh different generations. Mm. Um, because you're like, what can I give them? Like I'm 30, I've got, I'm 30 and married and have no kids. Um, how can I speak into, uh, being a parent? How can I speak into being a grandparent? How can I help you walk, um, through death? Um, the most, some of the most, uh, and, and I'll be, I'll be real honest. Like I kind of like ran away from that when I first got here because of that intimidation, like there was some serious insecurities there. And, um, and so I've, I, I feel like uh, in the early years in particular here at Arbor drive, like I failed in particular, the older generation in a lot of ways. Um, I'm, I'm awkward when I get to like sit down with people. And, and if you're, if you're talking with somebody that's in a different generation, I think that that is multiplied out, uh, because like, what do we talk about? Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't have arthritis. I don't know what that's like, you know, like, uh, and that was just sort of like the mindset that I had. And so my, um, my issue was, okay, I'm going to sort of like, like I'll, 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 I'll pray for them and, and, and talk to them on Sunday, but I don't know how to relate to them. Yeah. Uh, and I'm intimidated by trying to pastor them. And so, uh, I've been convicted about that lately and, trying to rectify that, um, through just doing some things that are uncomfortable for me, that like home visits, like home visits are uncomfortable for me. And, uh, and just trying to do that as a way of expressing, like, I do love you. Like I do care about you. And, and that that's been true. It's just, it hasn't been shown very well because of my own insecurities or whatever. And so, uh, for, for pastors, especially younger pastors, um, you've got to find ways to, uh, and this is what I'm learning is you've got to find ways to connect with people in different generations in ways that they will appreciate and that they'll get, Yeah, you know, uh, a text doesn't work. You can't, you can't do that. It doesn't matter whether they text or not. Um, I had a, I had a, there's a family in our church, the mom and dad are, are members and the, the two daughters are members. And, uh, there was something that happened and, uh, this is embarrassing. I sent a Facebook message, um, and I got a a message from the daughter or one of the daughters. They said, Hey, mom and dad, they like that. I, I I know what you're doing there, but that's, that's not going to cut it basically. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, so, Okay. I need to learn from that and I need to go step out of my comfort zone. So I think for, uh, for pastors, it starts by example, um, yeah, and, uh, which is an area that I've failed in for a long time. I think tied into that is I think for pastors, they want to shepherd the people that they, the way they want them to be, the, the way they want, the to way they want to be shepherded. Yeah. Yeah. So, and if, I'm like a loner. So right. text and, me and, and say I, you're praying for me. I'm, I'm good. the same way. So I think everybody else wants that. And this goes across the ministry, um, any ministry. So one of the things, I think one of the mistakes that I made when I came in is I wanted, um, I wanted the ministries that I oversaw to reflect, I think myself or what I liked, um, instead of looking at the church and saying, okay, what's going to feed them. Yeah. So, and I think one of the most challenging things with uh, multi-generational churches is figuring out what's going to feed us as a whole. Yeah. Especially when we're gathered corporately, I think because of those a, different needs, right? I th- yeah. And I think as we, as we're willing to be um, self-sacrificial, I think as we shepherd people individually, I think it's a little easier to to navigate that um, as far as seeing what needs to be done. Yeah. Now, doing that is a barrier in it of itself because that can be draining, and you can be pulled in five different directions with five different people, right? Right. Um, so that can be a chore in and of itself. But corporately, when we get together, I think is another beast because people have expectations of sermon length 
and uh, sermon depth. Song um, preparation. Song preparation. Yeah. Uh, preference. Style. The style in which we do um, hymns or uh, modern songs, uh, contemporary. So you've got all these things and different expectations. So trying to find the spot that works for your congregation yeah. and pulls them all together, I think is one of the challenges. And one of the biggest things in that is, are you willing to lay aside your own preferences and yeah. what you want to see happen and what you want to see people do um, and find what works for the body as a whole? Yeah. Um, with, of course, within the, if they want something that's unscriptural, where that's, that's right, yeah. out of the, out of the bounds of, or that's outside the boundaries. But if it's within the bounds of scripture um, and it's way over on the other side of where you would be, yeah. are you willing to come over there and say, this is where we need to be as yeah. a body? And I saw that, like I saw that with the shift in, in music uh, that right. we had here at Arbor Drive. I mean, we used to be very heavy in uh, more contemporary songs and we heard, I mean, we heard a lot of complaints about, we don't do hymns, we don't do hymns. Right. And one of the shifts that I saw you make was, we, okay, we're going to do hymns, but we're going to do them in a way that's benefiting the whole body. Right. So it's not necessarily, um, and that, that wasn't your preference uh, at all. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, as, as we pastor, like, the, I think one of the biggest helps for me has been having uh, multiple kids. Mm that have different personalities. Yeah. I've got to love Finley differently than I love Ainsley or not differently, but in a different way yeah. than I love Ainsley. Um, they're just, they're different, different personalities, different needs, different um, ways of responding to things. I have to talk to them differently. Uh, they're different phases in life, um, even though they're pretty close together. Yeah. Um, so that, that was really helpful to me. So from, from the pastoral perspective, like I think it starts with example uh, like you were saying, laying ourselves aside and, and caring for the people that God has given us, not wishing that we had a different congregation, Yeah, you know, not wishing that God would just give us all young people or all old people or whatever the preference is. Um, but being content with the congregation that God has given us. But then also, I think there's an aspect, an element of shepherding in which we are encouraging and equipping people to pursue one another in different age groups. Yeah. Um, and in, that's challenging. Yeah. And I think... I'll just talk from my own experience. So I, when I started um, working with our deception communities, I in, came across as demanding it. Like this is an expectation. Your groups need to have this. And by and large, I think our small groups rejected that. Mm -hmm. Like they, they were kind in, in a hearing, but they don't want to do that. So like, okay, well that, that was a giant failure that blew on my, my face. Like, and part of that was, and most of that was my fault in not coming in and seeing what was going on, yeah. not coming in and seeing how, uh, how these groups had grown um, in their relationships with each other in good and bad ways. Yeah. Um, and how, how do I shepherd in with where they're at, where they're at. Yeah. And so I, I made a, a large mistake and had to make an adjustment and say, Okay, I don't, I don't want to. I'm not going to try to hit this right now because they're not going to hear me yeah. if I try to poke at their groups breaking up or whatever it might be that need to happen. Instead, encourage them towards individually building relationships with people yeah. um, who aren't like them, who aren't in the same place. Um, Middle aged people go find an older person and a younger person and and start building into those people. Yeah, um, having them in your homes and same for the older and the younger. It's so, like, am I going to be self-aware enough to to make those adjustments and to say, okay, this isn't going to work the way that I thought it was going to work. I need to make an adjustment here on the fly. Yeah, there's two other things real quick. These are short. But one is uh, highlight in Scripture where the Bible assumes a multi-generational church and encourages that. So, like, I'm thinking in particular of, like, First Timothy, I think it is, where it's like, Younger men treat the older men as fathers. Right. Uh, older women train the younger women. There's this, there's this built in assumption that having people outside of your own generation is good for you. Um, so highlight that in scripture and emphasize that in scripture. Um, and the, the other thing that, that I would say real quick is, um, create, um, we, we have a phrase here. Uh, church ministry should be church-wide ministry. 
So, um, when we, when we plan, uh, so like Wednesday nights, for example, was right. exclusively youth. Yep. Um, and we've shifted that to include adults and we're making another adjustment this semester to try to focus on building relationships. So let the, the ministries of your church encourage this and build them in a way that everyone can participate in right. and, and benefit from those that exposure to other people and, uh, and other, in other phases of life. Yeah. I, I just, I wanted to tie into the older men and older women with younger men and younger women. I would also point out in first Timothy four. So same, same, uh, writer to the same person. Don't let um, anyone look down on you because of your youth. Yeah. I think what we, as we look at that, we should see that there's a mutual benefit. Yeah. So uh, sometimes what happens, uh, younger people come in and they're afraid um, to challenge mm-hmm. or an older person thinks I'm only here to mentor, to give you advice. And I don't gain anything from this. I'm here right. to, to feed. And I think what, if you look at the, the letter as a whole, you see there's this mutual yeah. uh, benefit to those relationships. Um, so it's not that one really needs it the more other. than the yeah. other. Yeah. It's that, no, we mutually need each other yeah. in this um, for that for the building up of the body. Yeah. So then for the congregation as a whole, for the ordinary um, church member, one of the things that I would say is don't feel like you need to know everybody in every generation, you know, like it's cool to have, it's, it's okay to have uh, a relationship that you've built and sort of going back to what you were saying about like, if it doesn't jive, like just because you're, you're not wired to be best friends with somebody doesn't mean that you can't love them and be in unity with them in the church. So we get this sort of idea that if I'm going to be in unity with people, I've got to know all of them. Um, Or if I'm going to have intergenerational relationships and I've got to have intergenerational relationships with everybody, that's not the case. Even in a small church, uh, you might have one or two people that stand out in your life that are in different generations that, that you invest in and then invest in you. That's okay. It's not, it doesn't have to be this, I mean, we don't have the capacity for it to begin with. I mean, if you think about the number of people that you can build meaningful relationships with, you're extremely limited. And so it it comes down to uh, the one, one of the things that I would say to the, to the congregation as a whole is we can have unity without being best friends with every single person. Right. We can have unity without having a, like a, a, a deep relationship with every single person but we need at least a couple of people in our lives that are in different phases of life that we have those types of relationships. And I think the difference in that is, do you hold on to every relationship you have with a closed fist or with an open hand? Right. So the, the biggest thing I've seen is I hold onto these relationships with a closed fist. And what I don't allow to happen is for other people to come into that. My fist is closed. I, nothing else can come into that. And what we need to do is we value those relationships but they're not the idol of our lives and they're not the end all and be all and the only people that we're around. They might be the people the majority of the time, but I'm willing to hold that with an open hand. So if God presents me with an opportunity yeah. like that, um, that's somebody outside of that normal sphere yeah. of um, friends that I would have, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to participate in that and I'm going to pursue people. Um, it, like you said, you don't have to have those, those, Every, you don't have to be everybody's best friend. You're not going to be able to do that, right. right? But you should have, you should have your life, your friendships should look like um, the church that you attend, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Like you should have probably a, a group of people and within that group, do you have somebody who's in a different area in life than you? Yeah. That is, that you go to, that is influential. And do you just have a general care um, for people and love for people that are outside of your normal sphere in life. Yeah. Another thing that I would say, um, on that is, um, be praying for specific people in different generations. Um, if we pray for one another, one another as a church and, and pray that God would open those, those doors to having those relationships, like don't just be passive in it or don't just be doing it on your own power. Like, okay, well I'm going to find somebody this Sunday 
Um, right. Actually, just start praying for people. Like get a copy of the membership roster in your church and start praying for people by name. And you might not even, I mean, you, you might not know who some of these people are, uh, but go to your pastor and say, hey, I've been praying for so-and-so. Can you introduce me to them? Um, and don't underestimate the power of prayer and asking God for good things that he desires for us is, is a good way to pray. So, uh, we should be asking, okay, Lord, I, will you open the door to a relationship with somebody that's older than me or younger than me or whatever? I think this, this just comes down to, do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Yeah. So whether it's your neighbor on the street or the people in the church, like, do you love the people in your church as much as you love yourself? And if, if you can say that, that that's true, then you're going to have real unity and a unity that's based around loving each other and being understanding with each other and desiring good things for each other yeah. instead of isolating yourselves within your, your group. And I think that's probably the best way to explain what, what I've, um, just what I've seen is there's just an isolation yeah. of ourselves and it's not in a, I don't like other people the way it's just, I, I really like being here in myself, yeah. um, in where I'm comfortable. So yeah. are you, do you like to be isolated amongst your friends, amongst the people you're comfortable with? And is that what you, you fall into and that's, that's where you live or do you enjoy those relationships and probably spend more time there? Yeah. But do you also value the other people who aren't like you um, in the body enough to invite them in and to be looking to, to serve yeah. alongside or, or even go and serve them as yeah. individuals too. So. Rela- relationships are built in large part upon shared experiences. And so like, I'm just thinking, for example, like practically speaking, I was sitting with, uh, with a couple um, in our church who are, who are older and uh, the wife regularly, uh, volunteers over at the, at the mission, or we'll go to the, to the jail and do jail ministry. Um, it could be for a younger person. It could be as simple as finding people that are, that are serving and ministering in different ways, whether it's in the church or outside of the walls of the church, whatever that is, and being like, Hey, I'd like to come along with you. Can, can I come this time? Right. Um, and like, you don't have a, you, you're just going to do a common thing together. Yeah. And in the process of that, you just, start to talk yeah. and you start to get to know one another and just doing things like, so find an interest that you have and find somebody else that shares that same interest, whether it's, you know, if it's doing ministry or whether it's shooting or whether it's whatever, find some sort of like common ground with somebody that you can start building something upon. Uh, that would be the last thing that I would, I would have. Good stuff. So I guess that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Another abrupt ending. <laughs> I don't know how to close the things out. Yeah, I don't either. We're just we're good at like we're getting good at the like the transitions at the beginning. We should um, just end with well, let's pray. Yeah, let's that's, pray. That's, that's how, how you I, do it in church. Yeah, let's, let's pray. <laughs> that's how every sermon ends. Uh, well, let's uh, let's just do this. Um, I I would just encourage you if you're listening to this and and you don't have those relationships with people outside of your generation, um, ask yourself this like. Or ethnicity. Or ethnicity, yeah. Um, In pursuing relationships with people that are different than me, am I doing it um, with the the mentality that I'm just going to benefit them? Or am I doing it with the mentality that this is going to be mutually beneficial for both of us and that God is going to use this in both of our lives to help us grow and point one another back to Christ and the gospel? Um, if, if you can see this as not just an opportunity for you to minister to somebody, but for, but to be ministered to, um, and see the need that you have to be ministered to by people outside of your own generation. I once heard somebody say like no 14 year old was ever the best influence on another 14 year old. Um, I think any parent of a teenager <laughs> would agree with that. The, the same is true for 36 year olds and, right. and 50 year olds and 80 year olds. Um, do you see the mutual benefit and are you willing to take the risk and take the effort to not only bless somebody else in the congregation, but be blessed by them? And so I've, I've been able to, and and this is maybe a little bit unique as, as being a pastor, but I've been able to walk through 
um, death with some people that are older. And those people have been such an example to me of uh, what it looks like to suffer with joy and to hope in Christ in the last moments of your life that I, you can't explain that. Um, it's, it's shaped some of the way that I view um, aging and, uh, and death and what I aspire to as a Christian and the attitude that I want to have when I get to that phase. Right. Um, so don't underestimate what it can do for you. So there we go. So we'll be back next week. <laughs> All right. Well, I- <laughs> Awkward silence. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope you will join us then. Uh, we'll talk about something. Something else. Yeah. We're kind of, uh, if you got ideas like um, of topics that you want us to talk about, you should pop those, send us a comment, send us a message. Oh, I got uh, Chris Sinclair Ooh. is going to be on the show. Oh, that'll soon. be good. That'll be really good. He had a, he had a clip of a sermon that he preached that was just like straight fire. So, um, we're, we'll play that for you when he's on, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna be talking with him and uh, yeah, give us suggestions, give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. All right, so do that and then tune in next week for the next discussion of the pastors' discussion podcast, your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life.